Get more people. I, I mean, I, I could have. I chose not to. Um, so. Just. All right. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and cover what we're supposed to talk about now. Um, when it comes to the engineering design process, um, the engineering design process is the same as the problem solving process. Problem solving process when applied to uh, learning knowledge develops, well, that's what turns into the scientific method because it requires the reliability and the ability to um, find more information. If you use the problem solving process to develop a tool by which you can use the tool to solve a problem, uh, that's the engineering design process. So. The purpose of the engineering design process is to develop a tool. Okay. Uh, by the way, that I haven't posted your quiz yet, but it's uh, going to be that. That's going to be one of the questions. Um, that's the first question, and the answer to the first question is: the engineering design process develops a tool. So um, I give all the answers the morning class, so I might as well give them to you too. Uh, so when you go through the engineering design process, the purpose is to create a tool. Um, the problem solving process has been specifically designed into the engineering design process as a way of taking problem solving and being able to, to do something with it. So the steps to the problem solving process of the engineering design process are, uh, first of all, you start with problem framing. Second, you do uh, ideation. It's where you come up with ideas. Third is realization. It's where you choose an idea and you create it for real. And then last one is evaluation or analysis um, where you determine whether or not your solution effectively solved the problem and what next steps you need to come up with. Uh, what we're going to be talking about primarily today uh, is the problem framing section. Now, we talked about this a lot on Friday, so I'm not going to jump into this with nearly the energetic tirades that I did then. Uh, but problem framing has five steps. Step one is identify the population. What, what population is going to use this tool? Uh, is it just going to be a small group of people? Is it going to be a small group of super athletes? Is it going to be uh, the common person? Okay. Step two is evaluating your constraints and your functional requirements, which I'll just put those on two different steps, but they're kind of done together. Step four is come up with your measures of quality. And step five uh, is to look at existing solutions. Okay, so if you follow all five steps of the problem of the uh, problem framing section, uh, you should have the definition of what you're solving, the idea of what makes a good solution, and your competition. Okay, all of those fit into whether or not you should even try to solve the problem by designing something new or just go purchase something that already exists. Okay? Sometimes in the engineering design process, you end up selecting your comp your competitor's product. That happens. You just say they have the market on that topic, we're going to focus our efforts elsewhere. Um, so engineering design process sometimes does not give um, the, what, the result that you would hope for. It doesn't always tell you, hey, let's make something brand new. Um, now that said, the engineering design process, if you frame it this way, uh, it actually does give you a lot of really good insight as to how you can make improvements. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So let's give an example. Uh, let's say you're doing the problem framing for a personal communication device. Okay, 
Not going to specifically label it as something. But let's start out with the first step in the problem, framing. Did you just kill him? No. We just voted him out. No, we voted him you just voted him out? Yeah. Were you not the no, imposter? I was not the imposter. He made the right decision in hey. the end. Hey, Whoever accused you first kind of sus. Okay. This person. Um, I wanted to talk to accuse you too because you reported two bodies in a row. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't even try a new reactor either. He just. Well, well, no, because I saw a uh, white. Why did you do No, I saw white come out of electrical, so I thought she meant it in for med day. So I went up to check med day. He could have won the game if he just didn't do reactive. Okay, so um, what is the population for a personal communication device? What kind of people would use a personal communication device? Those who want to communicate. Which would be? A large majority. A large majority. The CIA. What? But they're, they're on the download. Now, one thing that you can do as a part of the engineering design process and that you should do is this isn't just a single line. Okay, This isn't just a, meh, I'm going to design it for everybody. The idea is if you say, I'm going to design it for everybody, you need to know what those demographics are. Okay, there are, going, there are people who are paraplegics who cannot control a device with their arms or hands. If you have any kind of control that requires finger motions to use or control, they will not be able to do it. You would have to design something completely separate for, the, for that population. Similarly, there are people who are blind, there are people who are deaf, who would not be able to engage in either audio or visual stimulus on your communication device. So not every kind of person is going to be able to use a personal communicator. Okay. So when uh, Avery says a large majority of the population, what that comes down to is um, you're really dealing with a large majority of the healthy, average person uh, who doesn't have substantial disabilities. Um, I hate to say that, but that's, that's the target market for most things. There's only a small target market for people who do have disabilities. Um, so. You can keep that in mind, and this is one of the things why uh, designing for uh, ADA compliance is such a big thing anymore. Because it's a traditionally underserved market, people who don't have a lot of products that are specifically designed for them. Okay, but we're gonna not design for them too. So, step number two, um, identifying constraints, and we're gonna go ahead and do step three at the same time. Uh, constraints and functional requirements. What, to understand a constraint, it's something that has to be true in order for it to be a personal communicator, okay? Um, and similarly, with the functional requirements, it's something that this device has to do in order to be a personal communicator. So if we're looking at this, I like using the example of a light pole, okay? If I were to take a light pole and uh, um, Bend it. You're not even paying attention. I give all the answers to the, to the 8 o'clock class because they were all very attentive. If we were to take a light pole and use it to... Okay, you can repeat exactly what I said, but what context was that sentence put into? The... Personal communicator, well, I mean, not exactly the personal communicator. Why am I talking about a light pole? Um, for designing the thing for people who can't use it. Nope. Well, it was a good try. You, you were paying attention during that part. I was, I was paying like 50%. 50% attention. I want 100% attention. You guys can do this after class. Okay. Um, I am a genius. Thank you. Um, when it comes down to understanding your constraints and functional requirements, I like to use a light pole, and I didn't actually tell you the reason. <laughs> uh, I was very confused. I know. <laughs> well, yeah, because he said he used a light pole too, and then yep. in the middle of the sentence, which I was saying, right. that I was listening. And then I, was I know, no, no. See, this is a fun <laughs> thing that I like to do, is I like to mess with people. I didn't tell you why I mentioned a light pole. And the fact that you fought so hard to try to explain it showed that you weren't paying attention. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I wasn't paying attention for parts. 
For parts of it, yeah. Yeah. I was just messing with you though. Well, it's cool. <laughs> okay, so I like using a light pole because what what makes a light pole not a personal communicator? Okay. If I were to say I'm gonna, I know I need a personal communicator device. I'm gonna go grab a light pole. Okay. Why isn't a light pole a personal communicator? It is. It is not a personal communicator. Morse code. Hello. Exactly. If, if I use this light pole to hit somebody, it, it is communicating to them that I'm not happy. Yeah, but it's not very personal. It, it's, a, you know. it's a personal way of saying I don't fucking like you. OK, so in any case, I like using a light pole as a lot of examples because there are things that you would not, you would not, when you think of personal communication device, you don't think light pole. And there's a reason for that, okay? What makes a light pole person, what makes a light pole not a personal communication device? What about it? Yeah. It's big. It's gigantic. In order to make it personal, or in order to have a personal communication device, it has to be small. It has to be portable. And even a phone booth isn't a personal communicator because it's too big. So it has to be something that's portable in order to be a personal communication device. Now, if you wanted to find a personal communication device as a phone booth, that's on you. But it does change the problem a little bit. I have to pick some baseline definition to apply here. It wouldn't be personal. It would be more public. It is more public. Well, now you're getting into a... I'll, I'll come back to that point. Um, okay, so now we, we take a light pole, we make it small. Is this now a personal communication device? Why not, Ivana? It's not, it's not, I don't know, it communicate. It doesn't communicate. <laughs> it doesn't have the functionality, okay? So in order for it to be a personal communication device, it has to be portable and it has to communicate. Portable makes a personal communication, makes it a communication device, all right? So this is, this is the foundations of how we are starting to define what a, what a personal communicator is. It is a portable device that allows for transmission of, mes of messages, okay? Now we can make that definition a lot beefier, but we're just gonna stick with that for now, okay? So now, now we have a definition. These two combined together define what a portable communication device is. It's something that's portable, something that can communicate. That's it. We've defined a uh, personal communication device. Now we need to define what makes a good personal communication device. You can put a lot of things into this. What do you mean? Into the quality of it? Yes. You could have a list that's 100 items long. Yeah, so let's list a few of them. What makes it a good personal communication device? Yeah. Range, how far can it communicate? Right, and that's a measurable value. You can get a mile value, feet value, something like that. This is something that it will produce a number. Every device we, we look at for existing technology will have a number associated with range. What were you gonna say, Duncan? Okay. You have something? Yeah, does it need to be measurable? For this one, it needs to be measurable, but there is, it's kind of a, sometimes you create your own ways of developing a number for it. Like here, portability can be a number. Now, it, it, what, it, what number are you in portability? Well, it could be a size factor. You could say, you know, here's the ideal size. How deviant are you from that? So it doesn't have to be numberable, measurable in the sense that you, know, you can go out there with a sensor and find out. Sometimes it's you take a survey data, sometimes you, uh, you create a mathematical algorithm that takes dimensions from it or physical properties from it and produces a single number. The idea is number four, your measures of quality, these are comparable numbers. Constraints and functional requirements are yes, no conditions. Is it portable, yes or no? But you could also say portability here, because quite frankly, if it's this big, 
that's not portable because it's easy to get lost. And if it's this big, I mean, it's, it's kind of portable. You could carry it around everywhere, but it's hard. Yeah, you'd rather put it in your pocket. It, it, yeah, that pocket size is just about perfect. Yeah. So we can put a portability factor on here, and we can define it as how easy is it on a scale of 1 to 10 to carry around. Okay, so that, that if that's what kind of what related to what you were saying, it doesn't necessarily have to be something measurable, but it's something that you could go take this out to a group of people and say on a scale of one to 10, rank this device on how easy it is to carry, and then rank this device and rank this device, okay? All right, what other measures of quality um, would you have for a personal communication device? Yeah, clarity. Thank you. Yeah. I was trying to think of smaller word, but I can't remember. Ah, pff, it's Friday. Um, so we've got clarity. This is, you know, heart, 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 you know, doing the. You could talk about appearance. Okay. How easily can be destroyed? How easily can be destroyed? I like how you put that because I'm totally thinking of like, uh, oh man, burner phone. Uh, safety, right, you, the, one of the issues that a lot of people don't recognize with a cell phone is that these have microwaves in them. They're actually not safe. <laughs> I mean, it's within, it's within allowable values, but extended exposure to microwaves and personal communication devices is actually dangerous. Yes, that's another thing. If it's close to your face, you don't want it to explode. Yeah, usually. Usually. Unless that's just your goal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So this is, this is a good list, but as Duncan pointed out, we could continue making this list longer and longer. There are, there are hundreds of things that we could look at when it comes to identifying what makes a good solution here. And this is not just true for, uh, for personal communication devices, it's true for everything. Yes, yes you can. So, all right, now this part five of here is identifying existing solutions. Now, in order to identify existing solutions, I don't care about four. Four is great, four is good for identifying what kind of features it has to have and, and doing that. It's really, really important in the ideation phase but for right now, coming up with the existing solutions, we just need them to communicate and be portable. These two things define a por our personal communication device. Everything that is portable and communicates is an existing solution to this problem. Okay? Are you raising your hand or are you just stretching? No, I'm stretching. Cool. Okay, so now we've got hand and string. It's personal, communicates, it works. Carrier pigeon. Oh, I yep. It's personal. You can carry a pigeon around. No problem. Pigeons work for the government. It's a lot harder than you think. What? It's a lot harder to use a carrier pigeon than that. How do you know this? <laughs> it doesn't matter, but they have to be trained. They, like. The reason they go to a place yeah, is because they know that's their home. Yeah. So like you can't just carry a pigeon and be like, go find kale if that pigeon's home is Duncan's house. Okay. That's not how it works. Well, you then you find a pigeon from Carol's house. Pigeons are only good to get a hold of one person. I mean, yes, you're not wrong, but but this still technically doesn't say that it has to go to the right location. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Okay, um, 
other devices. Looking at the uh, the old little uh, oh from Home Alone, the thing that uh, and he would use to record his voice. It was a, an actual word for that, but CV thank you. Radio. Um, CV radios work. CV radios they are pretty great. Okay, then you have your obvious cell phone. You got your PDA. You have your wireless email um, tablet. I can't even think of words anymore. Okay, these are a bunch of different objects that all satisfy the problem. Now, the issue that we have is the if we were to keep going with this list and continue to name out every single thing that is ever used to transmit messages, which by the way, we could also write in uh, you know FedEx and send mail through FedEx. I can communicate by sending a book to somebody through FedEx. We use postal service. Smoke signals. I, yeah, smoke signals work. Morse code. The telegraph. The singing telegram. Brick with a note. Wow. Brick with note, yeah. <laughs> a floating bottle, yeah, a note in a bottle. <laughs> That's a pure personal communication device. Is it as portable? <laughs> Very personal, yes. But here we're we're getting this is this is kind of the point of this exercise. We only define a personal communication device as something that is portable that allows you to communicate. With this very vague definition, we have a gigantic number of solutions. In fact, if you were to turn this into a graph, because I'm a, I'm a scientist, uh, the number of solutions down here at the bottom is this shaded in section here. And then as you go up, this is the uh, specificity how specific you are in defining your problem. The more specific you are, the further you go up this pyramid, the fewer solutions you're going to have. Okay, now it is possible to be so specific that there are no solutions. Well, let's say you're like, well, in order to, you know, have this personal communication device, it has to be portable, has to f be flying, has to be something that runs off of uh, green energy, has to be something that teleports you to your best friend every time you want to talk to him. Like, it is possible to be so specific that there no longer exists any solutions that can possibly do it. It exists in this ethereal region up here that is not even real. Okay. Yet. 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 We can say the word yet. Yes. Okay. So when it comes to what what is best for the engineering design process, you don't actually want to end up right here. All right. Most oftentimes, when somebody produces a brand new piece of technology, they change the problem. And they become the pinnacle of this such that there's only one solution that really solves all of their problems. And it's that one thing. When iPhone introduced, when Apple introduced the iPhone, the iPhone was the only solution to personal communication. Because it redefined the problem such that the only thing that solved this problem was iPhone. There was nothing else. And that spe the specificity of all of those points meant you only could solve your problem of a personal communication device by buying an iPhone. It was brilliant. Now, since then, technology has changed. You guys said yet. Technology changes. When technology changes, now all of a sudden, there are multiple ways of connecting to the internet. There are multiple ways 
of developing a smartphone. We now have multiple solutions available again. Okay, and none of them is the absolute best. Unless you're a diehard Android or Apple fan or something, in which case then you think that, that it is the best. But in reality, there is not one that is so pinnacle in solving the problem that nothing else compares. What's the phone that never breaks? Nokia? Yeah, Nokia. <laughs> yes, okay, maybe the Nokia is up there. Yeah, you have to put the phone case on the Nokia to protect the world from the phone. I saw something where Nokia was getting into space travel now. They, they are in some really surprising industries. Like like, I, I read something they're not just getting travel. into space travel, they're getting into commercial space travel. Hmm. Like selling tickets to take billionaires to the moon. Interesting. It's just an acid trip. She's <laughs> <laughs> just getting... Don't make smartphones. They do, yeah. My brother owns a Nokia and he loves it. But the thing is, they've also recognized that if you go through this process and you identify we shouldn't be dumping money into this area, they don't. And this is where companies diversify. Companies understand how to, do, to solve problems that exist outside of their area. There's a huge amount of tooling, a huge amount of of change required for a company to go from one thing to another. Like when Elon Musk decided to go from selling cars to flamethrowers. Okay, there was a huge amount of, of effort that had to go into that. It turned out to just be a publicity stunt, it wasn't for money. Um, but it, it takes a lot of effort. And they designed a pretty, a pretty decent flamethrower, it was kind of lame. If you watch some web, some, uh, YouTube videos, they compare flamethrowers that are like real flamethrowers to the not a flamethrower um, produced by the Boring Company. Um, well, they made the flamethrowers where they are, so they, to buy them, it's to be a real flamethrower, it has to be over three feet, so it's just under three feet, so yep. it's done without It's not a flamethrower. Yeah, it's not telling them it's 2.99 feet. Yeah, and that was, that was kind of their goal, was to not, not have to be a weapon, be just under that. And uh, it was just a publicity stunt. It wasn't intended to do anything. But he saw a market, and it generated a ton of interest. And he jumped into that market. And it was funny, which anybody who does things just because it's funny, um, that's the kind of person who I relate with. <laughs> like, I just played Among Us at the beginning of class with all of you. <laughs> Uh, maybe at the end of class. Yes, I want to be in there. Hey, Ivana kind of sus. Um, I think my best was when I'm mad. When you're mad? Yeah, sounds stupid. <laughs> you know what? Whatever works. When she kills you in Among Us, I'm still going to vote for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't think you can vote for dead people. Um, um, so, when it comes down to the engineering design process, okay, going through the problem framing, how you define your problem is going, to is going to define what this comes up with. Do I think that as a class we could put our minds together and come up with a better personal communication device? Yeah. Yes, I actually do. Let's do it, let's get rich right now. Well, see the issue is it's not that easy. You can have a great idea and go broke. Did it? Did you ever buy a PS Vita? I did. No. Did you ever have a? Did you ever have a brother or sibling who had the Sega Game Gear in the 1990s? Oh, I played Sonic yes. and Mario Olympics. And what though? I All right, on, on the Wii. The PS Vita. Well, was well, a great system. That's not comparable. Uh, yeah, it had, it had so many games. The thing right, about Slugger, that was a great game. Um, but the thing about having a really uh, powerful idea is you can be a great innovator, come up with a great idea, such as the PlayStation Vita, which was ahead of its time, the Sega Game Gear, which was also way ahead of its time, uh, color graphics on a portable device. Uh, now, I grew up in the era of Sega Game Gear. Um, I spent a lot of money on batteries 
just so you can just so you can have two hours with with the Sega Game Gear. Um, it was awful. Uh, it was way ahead of its time, but the, the technology wasn't there to support it. And quite frankly, the market wasn't ready for it. The same with the PS Vita. The PS Vita was a brilliant thing. It was very fragile, extremely fragile, small. Uh, but then, then they took the concept of the Vita and they did it with the Switch. And the Switch was highly successful. Same concept, slightly larger. See, it didn't have the technology. It wasn't, it was, it was a great idea that was very innovative, but it wasn't quite there. Having a high definition, very powerful handheld device was ahead of its time. The market wasn't ready for it. The capabilities weren't ready for it. It didn't even realize what it could be. Just simply having a good idea doesn't mean you're successful. You have to solve the problem. The PS Vita had a number of problems with it that they did not associate in here, such as fragility, such as why would I want to spend my time playing a really high definition device right here when I can play it here. It didn't solve the problems. The, the Nintendo Switch capitalized on the problems the PS Vita had and the Nintendo Switch is still friggin' sold out. People advertise when they show up in stock. It's ridiculous. But that's how, that's the difference in how you define your problem. Changes everything. Okay? It all starts here. If we redefine the problem for a personal communicator, we could as a class come up with a better idea. I am positive of this. Okay? It doesn't take somebody with a degree in engineering to change the world or else we never we would still be playing with rocks and sticks because nobody would have ever changed the world. The very first person who changed the world didn't have a degree in anything. You don't need to have a degree either. Your degree does not define whether or not you're going to change the world. I'm about the message of this. I know, right? I am your professor and I'm telling you, you do not need a degree to change the world. Something else. Gonna have a drop. <laughs> Now that said, my job as a professor is to give you the tools by which you can better change the world. But you do not need them. But it might be a really good idea if you use them. And also I can prevent you a lot of heartaches, especially if you want to come up with a brand new great idea and try to market it. Because <laughs> I do have some experience in that area and uh, a lot of people I know who have failed in that area. So, recap, do the problem framing. Problem framing is critical. And understanding what each five of these mean is critical, which is why your quiz today is you have to show me you understand what these two mean. Functional requirements and measures of quality. What is a, what is a functional requirement? Anybody remember from last time? It has to do something. A functional requirement is a verb. It's an action item. It is something that it physically does. Okay? What is a measure of quality? It's a comparison value. It's an adjective, in a sense. So how well it does the job. It is how well it does something. Yes, it's a, it is, it's a descriptor. And it's something that you could come up with a measurable value by which you can compare two different ideas to each other, okay? You can put anything in measures of quality. You can put anything in functional requirements as long as it's a verb. What does it do? So, for example, a vehicle, uh, which your quiz has to do with vehicles, uh, a vehicle, the verb of what a vehicle does, what, what does a vehicle do? It transports. What else? It, it carries you. Not every vehicle does that. It gets you there faster than the good ones do. Well, it just transports you there. Sometimes so you can call a vehicle a vehicle even if it's really slow. 
It has to be something that is possibly mechanized. That would be a constraint. Um, constraint is that it has to have some kind of a power source to it. Um, an arc reactor. Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what the, the uh, functional requirements of a vehicle are. It, it, has to, it has to transport. It has to carry you. It has to hold things. Okay? On the other side, uh, the measures of quality for a vehicle. How fast it goes. How fuel, it how, how fuel efficient it is. How much space it has. How many things it can carry. What its weight capacity is. Safety. How safe it is. Right. All of these are things that we could assign a number value. By the way, people do assign number values to safety. You have a crash rating of five. How did they come up with that number? What? It's, it's, a, it's an intensive process to come up with a one through five number, but it's based on accelerations, amount of vehicle crush, and uh, uh, objects that contact occupants during the crash test. Did the person die? Nope, or five stars? Five stars. Yes. <laughs> yeah, with the with that one star taken away because they died. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't die that bad. It's okay. The, the dude died, but the eggs are still okay. Yeah, his, his groceries are fine. Um, but no, you you can't assign a, a one through five value to that because there is a scientific process by which you can come up with an algorithm. Measures of quality are ultimately something that can have a number associated with them by which you can use the number to compare it to another number. Okay? All right, any questions on this? Okay, um, then I'm going to stop this video.